Next speaker is Mona. We move on. Thank you, Evelyn and uh, uh, Gang. So we move on to Mona uh, Jarahi. Uh, so Mona Jarahi is a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, LA. So is going to talk. Uh, she is going to give a talk about new frontiers in Taylor's uh, technique. So as I know Mona for uh, yeah five or six years, the first time I heard Mona's talk was in uh, one international conference. It really gave me a big impression. You know, the uh, Taylor's is really you know can change the world and uh, can bring a lot of things in the new world. Uh, Mona was a uh, genius. You know, and the high school he was the top to win the Olympics, and then it became the superstar as a PhD in Stanford. After Stanford, he a, a professor, you know, at the University of Michigan and Edinburgh. So uh, he became a professor in the UCLA, you know, since you know a few years ago. Now I think Mona is really like in the way was all shining on the road, right? Yeah, to become a superstar in academia. So now we have Mona's new stories for new frontiers in Taylor's yeah, technology. So Mona, please. Uh, Mona, please turn on that. Okay. Uh, okay, good. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Mona, please. Yeah. Uh, thank uh, you very share your, much for your share your slides. Uh, kind introduction. Uh, so let me share my slides. Okay. Here it comes. Okay, Mona, please. Yeah. Now it's okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction and thanks for uh, this uh, great effort that you're uh, putting together uh, with uh, the seminar webinar series. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here today and talk about my work on terahertz technology. Um, so uh, I will in my talk uh, first start with some introduction for those of you who are not in the field. Uh, to uh, familiar, familiarize you with uh, the kind of uh, motivations we have to work in this field, the kind of fundamental and practical physical challenges we have, and how we've been trying to address it. Uh, the main motivation uh, for working at terahertz frequencies is really the unique applications of these waves. Uh, mainly because of the unique uh, properties of terahertz waves. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of materials have a very unique spectral signatures at terahertz frequencies, and a lot of optically opaque materials are more transparent at terahertz frequencies. Um, so terahertz waves offer a very unique platform for imaging and sensing. Uh, in addition to the fact that these are very low energy photons compared to X-rays or even ultraviolet and visible photons, uh, so there are no worries about ionization and destruction. Uh, because of these unique functionalities, uh, a lot of applications have been introduced and uh, these were very intriguing and they were my personal motivation to uh, start working in this field. Uh, here I'm showing some of my favorite lists, uh, basically shows you really the uh, breadth uh, of uh, the uh, range of applications. Uh, it starts with medical imaging, basically any kind of tissue uh, with different properties have different water content and, and different biomarkers. And as a result, uh, one can get uh, very uh, high uh, contrast in terahertz images uh, using terahertz waves. For example, here I'm showing uh, the visible image of skin that uh, has uh, melanoma, but you see the terahertz image offers a much better contrast despite some degradation in resolution. Uh, or in early stages of tooth decay when no physical damage has happened to the tooth and x-ray cannot pick it up, you can see terahertz can uh, uh, basically detect a lesion that starts forming and erode the tooth. 
in biosensing, any kind of biological process involves breaking some chemical bonds, adding new chemical bonds, and all of these change the spectral signature of the biomolecule. Uh, for example, um, it has been shown that when a single stranded DNA hybridizes, it's a spectrum changes, and this offers a very unique uh, way for biological sensing in a label-free way. Uh, security screening uh, basically is another uh, domain that in early days of terahertz brought a lot of funding to the field. I'm sure all of you are familiar with airport scanners uh, that can see through uh, packages, it can see through clothing in case of a hidden uh, object. Uh, so all of those are low frequency versions of terahertz uh, scanners, so uh, there is a big push to increase the frequency and efficiency of these devices uh, to be able to get better resolutions, better quality images uh, at terahertz frequencies. Uh, pharmaceutical uh, industry has benefited from terahertz scanners. Not only you can tell if the right chemical with the right dose is used in a drug, uh, but also you can say if the right crystalline form of the uh, chemical is used in a drug. Not only that, but also with terahertz uh, imaging, you can see through all different tablet layers uh, that you, ha you, ca you have. And uh, this is very important because any non-uniformity in the thickness or any void uh, can uh, impact uh, when the drug will, will be released in the body. Uh, so terahertz waves are the only way that you can uh, do this kind of quality control in a non-invasive way. Uh, in general, industrial quality control is uh, a very active area and uh, has been the area that was very successful uh, from commercial point of view. Basically, uh, terahertz scanners can see uh, the integrity of uh, a lot of products ranging from auto industry, aerospace industry, semiconductor industry, food industry. Uh, so uh, this has been the area that uh, there has been more products that you can imagine compared to other areas that are more in the research domain uh, using terahertz technology. Uh, and last but not the least uh, is the use of terahertz technology for atmospheric and space studies. In fact, more than 98% of uh, all the photons that have been emitted since the Big Bang are having signatures at terahertz frequencies. Uh, and this has allowed astrophysicists uh, to learn a lot uh, about uh, our universe, uh, different galaxies, uh, and answer questions about how planets are formed, how galaxies evolve. Uh, not only that, but also in uh, our own atmosphere to understand the level of um, different contaminations, uh, different greenhouse gases, and uh, the health of ozone layer. Uh, so as you can see, the range of applications of the technology uh, are a lot. Uh, so uh, this has been my motivation to come to the field. Uh, but uh, early on, when you start working in terahertz field, uh, especially if you start uh, about 15 years ago when I started, you'll see that uh, there are a lot of limitations in terms of the electronic and optoelectronic devices that are available uh, for uh, these demonstrations. Uh, in order to see what are uh, the fundamental physical limitations of terahertz, source, the terahertz devices, I start with sources uh, because terahertz sources are arguably the most important component that any kind of imaging or spectroscopy system has. Uh, so, if you think of terahertz frequency range, um, it is somewhere between uh, millimeter wave and radio frequencies and optical frequencies. So, why would we have any limit to build a source at terahertz frequency? So, first, let's see why not scaling the operation principles of electronic sources that we have available to cover the terahertz spectral range. So any kind of electronic source in the most basic way can be described by a transistor device, which is a solid state device that somehow you, uh, I'm just simplifying the problem to point out the fundamental limits. Somehow imagine that through an electronic source on chip, you generate a terahertz signal. 
If I want to radiate that signal, I have to dump that signal on a junction of a transistor, uh, initiate a current in the channel of a transistor, and route that current through an antenna to get terahertz radiation. Right at this step, if I ignore other physical limitations up to this point, I'm facing two physical limitations. One is that the transit time of charges in a semiconductor has some fundamental limitation. Uh, you can uh, try to accelerate charges very fast. Uh, however, at the end of the day, the speed of the charges are limited by scattering in the lattice of the semiconductor. So there is a frequency limitation how fast you can induce an ultra fast current in a semiconductor device. In addition, any solid state device, as you know, has parasitics, uh, capacitive parasitics, uh, inductive and resistive parasitics, and all of these will slow down uh, the operation of the device. So in the most general way, one can imagine that uh, a terahertz source, an electronic source, uh, has two poles that slow down its frequency response. One is because of transit time of charges, one because of the uh, our, uh, uh, RC time constant because of parasitics, and that gives us a roll off uh, of one over frequency to the power of four uh, in power. Uh, so that's very dramatic. And if you statistically look at the power of electronic sources as a function of frequency, you even see statistically what has been offered to us uh, has that kind of roll off. So that's more or less what, where we stand in, uh, when we want to bin, build an electronic fundamental oscillator. Uh, so you might ask, okay, why not trying to make our optical devices to laser terahertz radiation? So let's look how an optical uh, laser diode, for example, works. Basically, you have a PN junction, you forward bias it, you let uh, the charges resonate and recombine, and this recombination will result a photon. Well, the limit is here that the energy of this photon is equal to energy of the band gap energy of the semiconductor. So if you want to laser terahertz photons rather than, let's say, visible photons, then the band gap energy should be much lower than what we use in our laser diodes. Uh, and that's where we face a fundamental limit. The smallest bank of energy that a natural material offers is about 40 milli electron volt, which is equivalent to 10 terahertz. That tells us scaling this kind of laser diode concept to lower frequencies, lower than 10 terahertz, is challenging. And of course, there have been very smart ways around this problem, basically by stacking uh, thin layers of uh, semiconductors with different uh, band gap energies, one can create interband, uh, like basically by these quantum well structures, one can uh, gen uh, create interband and inter subband energy levels that gives you terahertz transition energies. However, the problem is that once you really go deep in the terahertz domain, these energy levels become comparable with thermal noise and phonon resonances in the lattice. So it becomes extremely hard to selectively inject carriers to the predefined energy levels without uh, cooling the device. So this is the basic operation, of course, simplified uh, basic principle operation of quantum cascade lasers that work at terahertz frequencies. However, as I mentioned, they require cryogenic cooling and that limits uh, their, uh, the scope of their applications. Uh, so these are the kind of limitations we face if we want to have a fundamental oscillator, either electronic version or optical version to work at terahertz frequencies. However, there are some other ways to bypass the problem. In fact, we know we have excellent optical sources. Uh, so if you find ways to convert energy of an optical source to terahertz, that, uh, that's another way to address the problem. There are two ways one can convert light to terahertz radiation. One is through uh, a nonlinear optical process. Basically, uh, you shine light on a nonlinear crystal and you embed terahertz frequency information in the envelope of your optical light, for example, by using a femtosecond laser, which is very short in time, or through photoconduction. 
So uh, the first technique, the nonlinear process, is a photon to photon interaction process. Basically, you have a high energy photon through a nonlinear process. You generate a terahertz photon, but there is another byproduct, uh, optical photon, to conserve energy in this scenario that still carries a lot of your information. So because of this single photon to photon interaction, and because of the fact that the energy of a terahertz photon is much lower than energy uh, of uh, a, a visible photon, let's say, the energy efficiency of this process is uh, very low. Of course, there has been techniques to recycle uh, the byproduct photon and uh, cascade multiple uh, nonlinear processes to increase this efficiency. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of requirements, not only for energy conservation, but also for momentum conservation and knowing the dispersion properties of nonlinear materials, it is extremely hard to continue cascading this nonlinear process uh, to get uh, very high efficiencies. However, the photoconductive technique uh, doesn't have that limit. So in a photoconductive technique, again, uh, you embed your terahertz frequency information in an optical beam, uh, again, like a femtosecond light source, and then you absorb uh, those photons in a semiconductor material and you apply a background electric field to accelerate these photons. And these accelerating photons will radiate. Now, the advantage here is that an accelerating photon can generate uh, an accelerating electron hole pair that is resulted as an absor uh, as a result of absorption of a photon can generate multiple terahertz photons. As a result, uh, one can get even more than 100% optical to terahertz conversion efficiency uh, when using photoconduction. Uh, that's why this technique is very attractive for high efficiency terahertz sources. And here, when I say more than 100%, uh, optical to terahertz conversion efficiency, I'm not violating any laws of physics. It's because, well, we have another source of energy through our uh, background electric field that injects energy to the system. Uh, so you can get uh, much higher optical to terahertz conversion efficiency. So in my next few slides, I explain uh, that despite uh, these techniques can potentially offer very high optical to terahertz conversion efficiency. When I started working in this field, the efficiencies were nowhere close to 100%. We haven't yet reached 100%. Uh, and I'll explain how by using spatial plasmonic nanostructures, we were able to make interaction of photon and semiconductors more efficient. And nowadays, we are reaching to efficiencies in the order of 15 to 20%. But still, there is a long way to go because fundamental physical limit tells us we have much, room, much more room to improve. So before elaborating about our technique, I just want to mention that it's not only a terahertz source that you need to build a terahertz system. Terahertz detectors are also very important uh, components. And the physical limitations of terahertz detectors are exactly the same physical limitations that sources have, basically. If you deal, if you want to use an electronic technique uh, to detect terahertz radiation like sources, again, you have to fight the slow transit time of carriers in a substrate and parasitic. And if you want to uh, basically build uh, an optical version of a terahertz detector, like a terahertz photo detector, like optical sources, your limitation is that the bang up energy of your semiconductor should match the energy of your terahertz photon. And that's where you have to compete with thermal noise and phonon resonances in the lattice. So cryogenic cooling will be a requirement. So it is for the same basic physical reasons uh, that electronic techniques and optical techniques are limited in both generation and detection of terahertz waves. And interestingly, all the optical conversion processes that I mentioned can be reverse operated for terahertz detection too. In a nonlinear uh, scenario, you can uh, let your terahertz photon and your optical photon interact in a nonlinear crystal and create an optical uh, photon as a byproduct of this process that carries information about intensity and uh, frequency information of terahertz 
wave. But again, because we have a photon to photon uh, um, interaction process, we are dealing with low efficiencies. The same is true for photoconductive techniques. Uh, to use a photoconductive technique for terahertz detection, all you have to do is uh, to absorb uh, uh, optical photons in your semiconductor device. But this time, instead of applying an external field to accelerate uh, the photo generated charges, you let the received terahertz electric field accelerate them and you sense uh, the photo current that is a byproduct of, of this interaction. Again, this technique can be very high efficiency. However, uh, when we started working on uh, photoconductive terahertz detector, the efficiencies were very limited and a use of plasmonic nanostructures allowed us to make the interaction much more efficient. And I'll show you how we were able to boost the performance of terahertz detectors uh, using uh, plasmonic nanostructures. Uh, so in my talk, I will uh, basically explain uh, how uh, the use of plasmonic nanostructures in the active area of terahertz sources and detectors allows to get a much more efficient interaction. And uh, I'll show how we were able to boost uh, terahertz radiation power and detection sensitivities by several orders of magnitude. Uh, the technique can be applied for terahertz radiation sources that oper op uh, operate at different frequency ranges, uh, uh, provide different bandwidths, uh, and as a result, we were able to uh, build various spectroscopy and spectrometry uh, devices and systems that allow us to, for example, study the ultrafast dynamic of carriers in semiconductor devices, uh, do uh, gas sensing, chemical detection uh, for various applications. Uh, also, I will explain that we have done uh, a lot of work in collaboration with various groups to integrate the light pump sources that are used in these devices with our plasmonic photoconductors to offer a single chip solution that is very compact and is useful for portable uh, applications. Uh, and uh, what I won't have a chance to discuss in my talk is that we have done also a lot of work to integrate uh, our terahertz optoelectronic devices with various rec reconfigurable metamaterials and metasurfaces to allow spatial and spectral manipulation of uh, the terahertz radiation, beam steering, intensity modulation, phase modulation. And uh, all of these are very important when you want to build an imaging or spectroscopy system. Uh, so uh, I'll uh, start digging more into uh, the terahertz sources that we have been realizing in my group. But before I want to show you uh, how a conventional photoconductive terahertz source is generally built. So you generally use a photoabsorbing semiconductor substrate. Uh, you integrate a photoconductor coupled to a terahertz antenna on top of this substrate. Uh, then uh, you uh, pump this photoconductor with an optical pumping. Now, this optical pump source is very, uh, very important because it carries all the terahertz frequency information that we want to generate. If one wants to generate a broadband terahertz pulse, uh, you uh, use a uh, femtosecond light source, which in time domain is very short. So in frequency domain, it carries a very broad frequency information. If you want to generate a continuous wave terahertz radiation, you heterodyne two CW optical beams with a terahertz frequency difference. Uh, and that way you can generate continuous wave terahertz. Uh, so what your photoconductor does is that when the photons are absorbed in the semiconductor, your photoconductor follows the envelope of the optical beam and generates a photo current proportional to that. This photocurrent is fed to the terahertz antenna, and uh, then radiation is generated. Uh, mostly photoconductive devices are placed on a silicon lens because uh, electromagnetic radiation is tending to be pulled more into high dielectric constant substrate. So this way, we can couple more radiation out of the device. And also, the silicon lens can be used uh, for focusing and manipulating uh, the beam shape of the terahertz beam. 
Now, here uh, I want to explain why we have a physical limitation. If you zoom in in the active area of the device where optical beam is incident, uh, I can explain how the efficiency of these devices are uh, limited. So to have efficient terahertz generation, the photons uh, that are in the optical beam have to be absorbed by the semiconductor and electron hole pairs, the blue uh, and uh, red spheres here are generated. So then uh, the applied uh, background electric field will accelerate separate these charges from each other. And once uh, these charges reach the uh, contact electrode to go to the antenna, then you are able to efficiently uh, feed your antenna with a current and get efficient radiation and radiation coupling to free space. The problem here is that uh, for carriers to uh, contribute efficiently to terahertz radiation, the transit time of carriers to the contact electrode should be less than a terahertz cycle. So let's take one terahertz as a reference point here. That means the transit time of charges should be less than a picosecond. Now, the problem you might say, I, I can get a very fast transition of my charges within a less than a picosecond uh, by applying a strong electric field to sweep the carriers faster. And unfortunately that doesn't work because you can accelerate the charges more and more, but after a certain level, the velocity of charges in the substrate are limited by scattering. So if you consider the fastest uh, velocity of charges, for example, in gallium arsenide, uh, you are reaching to velocities in the order of 10 to the seven centimeter per second, which means if you want a sub picosecond transit time for carriers, then the distance of the carrier uh, from the contact electrodes should be less than a hundred nanometer. Now, the problem is that because of diffraction limit, you cannot focus light to some to such small dimensions. As a result, a lot of charges uh, have a very slow transition to the contact electrodes and cannot efficiently contribute to terahertz radiation. So to address this problem, uh, we have looked at embedding plasmonic nanostructures uh, inside a contact electrode of uh, these devices. And what plasmonic structures do is that if their geometry is selected right, uh, when the optical beam is incident on the uh, plasmonic structures, you can excite surface plasmon waves uh, on top of the uh, plasmonic electrode. And the excitations of surface plasmon waves will basically concentrate most of your light at the junction between metal and semiconductor while, while allowing you to funnel light at dimensions that are deep diffraction limited, less than 100 nanometer. So by doing this, uh, you have artificially uh, brought light and as a result, the generated photocarriers very close to your contact electrodes. Uh, so although the velocity of carriers in the substrate are still limited, uh, by scattering, but at least the distance of carriers, majority of carriers that have been shortened so much that you get very ultra fast response for the majority of carriers. Uh, so we have uh, tried this concept. Uh, we started using plasmonic gratings for this purpose. Uh, the reason we like plasmonic gratings uh, is that, uh, well, by controlling the aspect ratio of the plasmonic grating, uh, you can uh, change the modes of the surface plasmon waves and modes that you couple uh, to these electrodes, as you can see from this finite element analysis. For example, by changing the aspect ratio of the gratings, you can move from the zeroth order resonance to first, second, third order. And that allows you uh, not only to get efficient interaction between light and semiconductor, but even couple terahertz radiation and other uh, optical wavelengths to the same channel. And with that, we are able to do multi-spectral terahertz uh, uh, generation and detection, as I will explain uh, later. So for our first generation uh, plasmonic terahertz source, we use a grating with a thickness much smaller than wavelength. So we are basically exciting the zeroth order sur surface plasmon waves. Uh, so before showing the impact of using uh, these uh, plasmonic gratings, 
um, I want to show the finite element analysis. Uh, so we compared uh, in conducted terahertz source uh, without plasmonic gratings with a very comparable device with plasmonic gratings. And when I say very comparable, I mean that these are uh, built on the same substrate uh, and uh, they're using the same antenna with the same frequency response. Uh, so the only difference in the radiation properties will come from existence and not, uh, lack of surface plasmon enhancement. In the case that we don't have surface plasmon waves, if you look at interaction of light with the contact electrodes, we have just a small enhancement right at the edge of electrode but the rest of light is basically spread in the substrate because of diffraction limits. However, if you use um, a plasmonic gratings, at least with this geometry that we use, you'll see that light can be much better concentrated at the edge of electrodes, and not only in a lateral way, but also in a vertical way. And here, if uh, I go ahead and count the number of photons that are generated within 100 nanometer distance from uh, the contact electrode, non-plasmonic contact electrode, and that of a plasmonic contact electrode, I will count 10 times more photons. That means for a plasmonic device, I will expect 10 times higher photocurrent. And because the terahertz radiation of an antenna has a quadratic relation with the current you feed to it, I would expect two orders of magnitude better efficiencies out of a plasmonic design. And that was what uh, we experimentally could observe. Basically, we uh, developed uh, two uh, comparable uh, photoconductive antennas with and without plasmonic contact electrodes, basically the same design I showed in the previous slide. And as you can see, we were able to increase the terahertz power by a factor of 50. If you trace this enhancement back to the photocurrent that we generate in our antenna, you'll see a seven time enhancement in the photocurrent. So it basically confirms uh, that uh, first, terahertz radiation power and enhancement has a quadratic relation with the current and that it is because of the photocurrent enhancement that you get such a huge enhancement in uh, the terahertz radiation power. Now, uh, as I mentioned, a very uh, uh, advantageous uh, property of these photoconductive devices uh, is that uh, one uh, can basically uh, use uh, uh, reverse operate these devices to get better uh, detection sensitivities uh, as well as uh, radiation power. So the same device we use as a source, we reverse operated it as a detector to see the enhancement performance. And as I mentioned before, in order to do that, you just need to disconnect the background uh, bias electric field that you apply and let the receive terahertz radiation to accelerate the charges and you just detect your terahertz through the photocurrent that is induced as a result of this process. So as you can see uh, here, we tested uh, our terahertz uh, detector uh, with a commercially available source that we had at that time. So here you see in both time domain and frequency domain, uh, the plasmonic photoconductive uh, device offers 30 times higher detection sensitivities. And that detection sensitivity is uh, applicable to a bandwidth of more than 1.5 terahertz. Uh, so this was uh, an initial point for our um, introduction of plasmonic terahertz devices after this point. Uh, we looked at more practical uh, devices. Uh, one of the, the, the initial device was not really built for any specific bandwidth, specific frequency range. Uh, but then we started looking at various type of terahertz applications. One application that uh, we work in, in my group is medical imaging. Uh, in medical imaging, because we are limited by diffraction, in order to get a good uh, depth resolution in our images, we prefer to work te with terahertz pulses because that way the, the resolution of the image comes from the time of flight of the pulse rather than uh, wavelength. Uh, so uh, for uh, pulsed imaging, uh, one wants very, uh, very short terahertz pulses, but at the same time, one needs a very broad band, uh, which means very broad band radiation, but also because tissues have a high water content, 
which are attenuating terahertz wave, one also needs a very high power. And in the antenna world, that's a difficult problem because we always uh, refer to resonant antennas when we want high powers. And when we want to gain bandwidth, we usually reduce the radiation power of antenna. So fortunately, this problem can be easily addressed when we deal with optical antennas. Basically, we have used uh, Hertzian uh, optical uh, antennas, uh, nanoscale antennas, uh, that although the efficiency of each antenna can be low because the length of antenna is much shorter than wavelength, but because we can stack many of these antennas uh, very packed next to each other, and because of the fact that in far field, the radiation power of these antennas adds up constructively, we can overall get very high power and uh, broad bandwidth out of these antennas. And this is a uh, advantage we have when we have optical antennas. Uh, with electrical antennas, one cannot benefit from this because you cannot imagine feeding uh, multiple nano antennas so close to each other electronically. Uh, so using this technique and again designing the antennas in a way that you excite surface plasma on waves, we were able to generate record high terahertz power out of these nano antenna arrays where here you see scanning electron microscopy image of the device. Uh, we are able to generate uh, several milliwatts of terahertz power with bandwidths uh, exceeding five uh, terahertz. And uh, these devices, uh, as previous ones, uh, can be reverse operated to act as a terahertz detector. However, when you deal with a terahertz detector, you have to design your nano antennas, not only in a way that you enhance light and semiconductor interaction, but also because your terahertz field is going to accelerate the photo generated charges, uh, you would like to also have a very high interaction between terahertz electric field and optical field in the substrate. And that results in a modified antenna structure that you can uh, get a high confinement of both fields at the same time. So combining uh, a, a nano antenna array as a detector like this and the nano antenna array I showed in the previous slide as a source, as you can see, we are able to generate record high signal to noise ratios we do when we do broadband spectroscopy. Uh, so here I'm showing a signal to noise ratio exceeding 100 dB. Uh, later, we were able to optimize the an antenna further and enhance uh, that uh, signal to noise ratio further, even up to 140 dB. Like we are literally at a point that uh, in order to record uh, our signal to noise ratio, we are limited by the number of bits that our data card can read. Uh, so here uh, I'm showing you how this kind of broad bandwidth and high signal to noise ratio allows us uh, to uh, do very high sensitivity gas scanning. For example, here uh, I'm showing the spectrum of a gas cell with and without am uh, ammonia. Uh, and uh, here I'm using very low level of ammonia, few part per billion. This is a gas cell of only one centimeter depth. Uh, as you can see, we are able to detect all spectral signatures of ammonia all the way uh, above, uh, beyond uh, five terahertz frequencies. So ammonia is a very important gas in the sense that uh, we carry it in our breath. Uh, so a lot of diseases, especially kidney complications, uh, have signatures in the ammonia that we have in our breath. Uh, so uh, this uh, can be used for breath analysis. And nowadays, with all the techniques that we're exploring for COVID detection, uh, maybe uh, breath analysis, uh, if we can find uh, specific chemicals that uh, are unique uh, for uh, COVID patients and uh, you can find it all, in all patients and doesn't change by, uh, from patient to patient. This can be another platform uh, for even COVID detection. Uh, so, but here I want to go back to uh, the more physical processes that we have explored. Uh, so one advantage of uh, these plasmonic uh, antennas is that not only uh, you can engineer light to have better interaction with the semiconductor, but also you can engineer your semiconductor to enhance the uh, bias electric field that accelerate charges. Uh, one of the problems that we have with photoconductive devices that operate at uh, telecom wavelengths is that 
uh, at telecom wavelengths, the photoabsorbing substrate have very low, low resistivity. So if you want to apply a strong bias voltage, you create a lot of leakage current and dark current uh, that can burn your device. That's why the uh, power limit of photoconductive devices working at telecom wavelengths is limited. So here we have come up with a new technique to bypass that leakage current. Uh, so we have um, found a way uh, to grow specific semiconductor structures uh, that basically, when you put it in contact with uh, a contact electrode, uh, you significantly uh, bend the bang up energy. Uh, so in this case, by specific high, uh, highly doping indium arsenide, uh, P-type doping, and putting in contact with Thai gold, we are able to get this a strong band bending, which means you create a very strong electric field under the substrate, which means charges that are generated in those regions can be accelerated uh, without a need for any background bias. And this can offer a very robust device. But you might say, okay, I have a very strong electric field uh, under a metal electrode. How can my terahertz beam reach there? Uh, how can my optical beam reach there? Uh, that's a, a good point. However, plasmonic structures bypass that problem. In fact, uh, by excitation, if we design the metal electrode as before, as uh, structures that excite uh, surface plasmons, you can funnel light right under electrodes and enhance your charges uh, exactly where uh, the bias electric field is maximized. So you can have a totally bias-free uh, terahertz generation process. So uh, this is the device based on this concept that we built, basically nano antennas on top of a highly p of indium uh, arsenide substrate. Uh, so here you can see the spectrum uh, of this device we detect. Uh, it is exceeding 110 uh, dB. And if you look at uh, the terahertz power and optical energies that uh, will generate as a part of this process are very competitive and even better than what we have in the state of the uh, art devices. So here I compare uh, our bias-free devices with other bias-free photoconductive sources that not only operate at uh, telecom wavelengths, but also at uh, much uh, lo lower wavelengths at which uh, you don't even have the thermal limit. Uh, and these are sources based on nonlinear optical processes for the Demer effect and spintronic. So the issue with these sources is that in order to generate a reasonable terahertz powers, they have to be pumped with very high energy optical beams. These are gigantic setups uh, that are not useful for portable applications. Uh, some of them are uh, not even implementable in a lot of uh, research labs that we have. Uh, so if one wants to uh, work uh, with compact femtosecond lasers uh, for future products, you're dealing with very low energy optical pulses. And this is the range where nonlinear optical processes and for the Demer uh, processes offer very low uh, efficiencies. Here you see that our bias-free device, uh, the results that I'm showing with stars, offer orders of magnitude better uh, optical to terahertz conversion efficiencies. And remember that this is a device that is compatible with femtosecond fiber laser. So we have simply placed our nanostructure chip at the tip of a fiber uh, and uh, just got a terahertz laser out of it. So basically a fiber that radiates terahertz radiation. So other techniques that use nonlinear optical processes, uh, spintronics, all require very sophisticated optics to focus the beam, to apply external magnetic field. So here you don't require any of them you just uh, place your nanostructures at the tip of fiber. And you can see that uh, this nanostructure uh, offers you very broad bandwidth, uh, exceeding 4.5 terahertz, and signal to noise ratios more than 110 dB. So this is as compact as one can go with a terahertz source. And obviously, that opens up a lot of applications. Uh, one other thing I have to mention is that these sources are extremely reliable. As I mentioned, a big problem in the community right now is that these devices burn easily because of leakage current. Uh, but we have actually uh, had very hard time burning any device. We have even sent many devices to our collaborators and challenged them to try to burn it. 
and uh, th there hasn't been much luck in uh, thermal, uh, thermally breaking these devices. Uh, so I uh, want to mention that uh, these 2D nanostructures that we use are not the only way that one can enhance light matter interaction uh, because uh, a lot of enhancement is on the surface and we lose a lot of uh, charges in the substrate. There are ways to convert our plasmonic nanostructure to plasmonic nanocavities to enhance light matter interaction further. For example, here we have used a, a substrate with a distributed Bragg reflector and a gallium arsenide sandwich in between. And this creates a nanocavity that we can uh, recycle light and have a very high concentration at a very short distance from the electrodes. As you can see, this by itself has increased our signal to noise ratio by one order of magnitude. So uh, we can, by, uh, by uh, highly concentrating light at, nanos, uh, at nanoscale, uh, we would be able to improve these efficiencies and further and further. Uh, in another work, in order to enhance light matter interaction in 3D, what we have done was that instead of forming a nanocavity, we formed our plasmonic electrodes in a 3D way. Uh, so here, these plasmonic electrodes are connected to a logarithmic spiral antenna. And the idea is that when you, uh, these, when you have your optical beam incident on these 3D plasmonic structures, you can find them well between the sidewalls of these slab wave guys you form by the grating. Uh, so before showing uh, how uh, these kinds of 3D plasmonic structure can help with the performance, I want to show the finite element analysis results. Uh, so here we want to compare two identical antennas, both logarithmic spiral, where one of them has a 2D plasmonic contact electrode and the other one has a 3D plasmonic contact electrode with the geometry that I'm showing. Remember the 2D one was the one that already gave us two orders of magnitude enhancement in radiation power compared to conventional designs. Uh, so as you can see here, when you use 3D plasmonic electrodes, you have a much better concentration of light compared to the 2D case. And here, if you go ahead and count the number of photons, you see you have three times more number of photons in the 3D plasmonic case compared to 2D. That means we should expect uh, three times higher photocurrent levels. And because of quadratic relation of photocurrent and radiation from antenna, we would expect an order of magnitude, even better uh, optical to terahertz conversion efficiencies. And that was something that we uh, experimentally demonstrated. So here, I just want to mention to make uh, the 3D plasmonic structures, we uh, use an aspect ratio that is able to excite the second order resonance mode. Uh, so here I'm showing the design and uh, it, I just want to mention that this design is optimized for operation at 800 nanometer, which was the laser we used for this study. One uh, delicate thing about uh, these 3D plasmonic structures is that because light coupling happens through excitation uh, of surface plasmon waves and uh, the surface plasmon waves are matched to the resonance mode of these waveguides, uh, the coupling bandwidth is more narrow. So uh, the fabrication is very delicate in the sense that uh, if your bandwidth of your laser is limited by not getting the right height of the uh, plasmonic electrodes, you can reduce your coupling efficiency. Uh, although uh, many uh, uh, lasers give you the flexibility in wavelength tuning, but we wanted to make a, a very robust process that you can control uh, the height of the electrodes very closely. And, and that was done through a two uh, hard mask fabrication process. We use nickel and a silicon dioxide hard mask. Uh, so first we pattern silicon dioxide with our nanostructures uh, nickel nanostructures, and then we etch away uh, our gallium arsenide. Uh, so uh, the slope of these sidewalls are specifically controlled such that with a directional uh, metal deposition, we, have, we can get a good side coverage on the uh, plasmonic structures, but at the same time have an easy time lifting off. And finally, we put an anti-reflection coating to maximize light coupling. As you can see, uh, here, <clears throat> the SEM results show a very 
uh, uniform coverage, metal coverage on the sidewalls of these electrodes, although uh, the uh, height is like 400 nanometer and the gap is in the order of 70, 80 nanometer. And you can see that even experimental results suggest uh, that uh, with this specific control of the height, we are able to get our optimum optical coupling at 800 nanometer wavelength. Uh, so uh, we have uh, used uh, these structures in a photoconductive uh, terahertz source. Uh, and here is the top view of the device zooming in uh, on the contact electrodes. As you can see, uh, we are generating uh, terahertz powers that are an order of magnitude higher than a comparable device exactly with the same antenna, but which is based on a 2D plasmonic electrode. Uh, so here we are getting an additional order of magnitude enhancement in power. Uh, so we are very excited that at about 1.5 milliwatt, we are generating more than 110 microwatt terahertz power. Uh, this is 7.5% uh, uh, optical to terahertz conversion efficiency. But I have to mention in our optical setup with silicon lens and other lenses that we use, we are losing some power. So this really translates to about 15% optical to terahertz conversion efficiency. And as you can see, by uh, making uh, plasmonic nanostructures that make light matter interaction more efficient, we are getting closer to the fundamental limit of 100%. Of course, we are not there yet, uh, but uh, we are uh, working on making more uh, efficient plasmonic nanocavities for this to happen. And in that process, a major limit we are facing is um, the fact that uh, as you confine light more next to plasmonic electrodes, you have to also fight plasmonic losses. So uh, there are a lot of uh, novel techniques that uh, should be explored uh, to address this loss problem at the same time. I uh, just want to mention that uh, although some of the results that I showed so far was for pulse terahertz generation, uh, one can pump uh, similar devices uh, with two heterodyning optical beams to generate continuous wave terahertz radiation. So here I'm showing uh, that a very similar device uh, optimized uh, for operation at telecom wavelengths uh, allowed us to generate very broadly tunable continuous wave terahertz radiation anywhere from uh, 100 gigahertz to 2.5 terahertz. In fact, our laser tunability was limited. Otherwise, we could um, basically get more broadband terahertz radiation. And here you see we are getting uh, power levels around one terahertz close to one milliwatt, uh, which is record high. Uh, I just want to also mention that uh, all of these uh, devices can be integrated with on-chip sources. So in collaboration with Dublin City University, uh, we have integrated uh, our photoconductive devices with uh, two-stage VFP lasers. We're able uh, to show very broad uh, frequency tuning in terahertz uh, radiation. So here I show that this uh, dual DFB laser allows us to tune the optical bead anywhere from 0.15 terahertz to three terahertz. And uh, if you look at the terahertz radiation we get, uh, we, uh, for example, at 1.62 terahertz, we get a fraction of a milliwatt. These are really record high powers and the tunability is very broad going all the way from um, 100 gigahertz to close to three terahertz. Uh, so we have also integrated our devices uh, with on-chip uh, frequency comb lasers in collaboration with Professor Chi Wei Wang at UCLA, uh, where they have these beautiful silicon-based uh, micro-resonators uh, that uh, generate all these optical tones uh, that we use the beat frequency to generate terahertz. The beauty of these uh, frequency comb lasers is that uh, although uh, variations in the environmental properties uh, can shift uh, the comb lines, but the beat frequency which determines terahertz radiation can stay very stable. So here you see uh, that we have integrated uh, these frequency combs again with our uh, terahertz for the conductive sources and we achieved uh, tunable terahertz radiation uh, with uh, powers of a fraction of a milliwatt in about one terahertz range. Uh, these uh, photo mixer, plasmonic photo mixers uh, have been used also for uh, spectrometry. 
in fact, uh, conventional uh, spectrometers that are used in terahertz uh, use a mixer to down convert the terahertz radiation when they mix it with a local oscillator signal. Uh, and that process will down convert the signal to a low intermediate IF frequency. However, the limitation we face when we want to have a very high efficiency spectrometry is uh, that uh, a lot of mixers need to be cryogenically cooled uh, in order to give you high efficiencies. And also, if you want to get a broad optical tuning, you need a very broad band uh, terahertz local oscillator. All of these are limited. Uh, so a technique we have come up with to bypass that problem is as follows. Uh, we use our plasmonic photoconductors. Uh, we pump them with a heterodyning optical beam uh, with a terahertz bit frequency. This optical beam is incident on the plasmonic structures, so you can concentrate light tightly next to the contact electrodes of the antenna. So at the same time, we are uh, inducing terahertz electric field that is uh, grabbed by our antenna. So we have a very efficient interaction with terahertz field that accelerate these charges and charges. Now the charges intensity follow the envelope of the optical beam. So if the optical beam um, has terahertz frequency information, uh, which is determined by this beat frequency, the carriers carry that frequency information. Then the drift current that is a result of terahertz field drifting the charges is the mathematical byproduct of the charge uh, frequency information and the like terahertz frequency information. That means by specifically selecting the optical beat frequency near the terahertz frequency we are interested in detecting, we can down convert as a result of this mixing product, uh, the mixing product to low frequencies at the difference of these two frequencies. So we can have a very lo low frequency byproduct that exactly reflects our terahertz frequency. So we have made an optically assisted terahertz to radio frequency, let's say gigahertz frequency converter. Uh, so here is uh, the specific plasmonic uh, nano antenna we designed for this purpose. And we tested it uh, with, uh, in collaboration with JPL with one of the sources they made uh, for Herschel mission. The source is operating at 0.55 terahertz. When we specifically control our optical beat frequency from our double DFB lasers to be uh, close to this 0.55 terahertz uh, by only one gigahertz, you'll see on an electrical spectrum analyzer, the mixing product is exactly appearing at one gigahertz. And uh, by stabilizing the laser, one can uh, look at the line width uh, of this mixing product you'll see that the line width is around one kilohertz. That basically the line width of the terahertz source we use. So this technique can give you very high resolution and high accuracy terahertz generation. I say high accuracy because by increasing the optical pump power, you can increase signal uh, in a quadratic way where your noise increases only in a linear way. So as far as you're not limited by thermal breakdown, the signal to noise ratio can be increased. I will show that with this technique, we were able to offer record high uh, detection sensitivities at terahertz and record high bandwidth while operating at room temperature. Uh, so uh, to test the sensitivity of the device, uh, what we do in uh, the terahertz, uh, uh, basically uh, community, the way we analyze the sensitivity of these uh, heterodyne uh, terahertz receivers is uh, through uh, thermal uh, loads. Basically, we use a hot load and cold load, and that way we can uh, look at the contrast in the output of our detector. And through that, we can assess uh, a Y factor that looks at this ratio, and we can extract an effective noise temperature that uh, determines how sensitive your detector is. So here you see, because we use a linear process for mixing and down converting at different frequencies as a function of the thermal temperature, we get a very linear response, uh, which is another advantage of our 
technique, which unlike other nonlinear techniques, uh, have limited uh, dynamic range and linearity. So once we translate uh, this Y factor to effective noise temperature, you'll see that we are getting noise temperatures very close to quantum uh, noise limit. For example, at three terahertz, we are reaching three times quantum noise limit, where even cryogenically cooled hot electron barometers don't offer that kind of detection sensitivity. So here you'll see that um, uh, at low frequencies, uh, uh, superconducting insulator, superconducting mixers offer very high efficiencies, but these are cryogenically cooled receivers. And above one terahertz, where these devices become lower efficiency and don't operate basically, we are able to get much better efficiencies. And if you compare it with Schottky diode frequency converters, which are only room temperature devices, available, we offer much better sensitivities. In addition, I want to mention uh, that while different data points you see from literature here were generated using different uh, heterodyne receivers optimized for different frequencies, the results that we are generating here are all with a single receiver. And the only mechanism we have for this broad scanning in frequency is just by tuning the optical bit frequency which uh, offers us a record high tunability of five terahertz. And, and this tunability allows us to do a lot of spectroscopy. Uh, so an advantage that this kind of technique has is that because the frequency selection is done by the optical bead, uh, if you want to scan a very high frequency range with a high frequency tunability, you can literally park your optical Beat frequency at specific spectral lines you are interested, and then fine tune your optical bead to uh, scan the spectrum with very high spectral resolution. So here, for example, we use an ammonia gas cell again, part per billion, very low concentration of ammonia, and by this piecewise scanning of the spectrum, we are able to detect all the spectral signatures of ammonia all the way uh, from one terahertz. Uh, to close to five terahertz, all through the same instrument and all through a very compact room temperature device uh, that is not available um, uh, before, was not available before. Uh, so in summary, um, I uh, hope I uh, showed you uh, the prospects of uh, plasmonic uh, uh, and nanotechnology to improve the performance of terahertz optoelectronic devices. I didn't have time uh, to talk about a lot of applications we are pursuing in my group uh, for various imaging and sensing applications. We recently had a spin-off company from our group that uh, is commercializing uh, our technology uh, for large scale uh, manufacturing uh, and uh, quality control uh, cameras in different industrial settings. And also, I didn't get a chance to talk about the reconfigurable metamaterials, metasurfaces we're working on, uh, but please check my group website uh, for uh, references that describe those work. Uh, so uh, with that, I understand that I'm running out of time, but uh, most importantly, not to miss this part, uh, I would like to thank uh, my group members uh, who have uh, basically uh, done this amazing work uh, throughout the uh, years uh, and uh, uh, the uh, sponsors. Uh, so we have been fortunate uh, to uh, get very generous uh, funding for our work thanks to broad uh, applications of uh, terahertz technology in various uh, medical, uh, energy, uh, and uh, basically uh, basic science applications and space explorations. Uh, so that concludes my talk. I thank you for your attention and would be happy to take your questions. Okay, great, Bona. Congratulations for your wonderful talk, as always. So there are a lot of questions here. We directly go to the question part. Yeah, uh, first of all, it's good evening. I know you are good morning. Yeah, uh, Professor Bona, this is an interesting topic. What's your opinion on application of a photoconductive Tyler source based on plasmonic you know, antenna in 6G communication? 
Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, that's one area that uh, we are working on and I didn't get a chance uh, to talk much. Uh, so currently for, uh, as, uh, for 5G, 6G, so, uh, well, I think we are still figuring out the exact protocols for 6G, uh, but uh, for sure we are pushing the frequencies higher. Uh, so uh, I would say uh, up to frequencies uh, around uh, 100, 200 gigahertz, electronic sources are offering very good efficiencies to uh, basically justify their low prices. Uh, the photoconductive devices that I work on uh, are more pricey. So one has to think a second time when he wants to use it in a cell phone. Uh, but uh, as you go to higher frequencies, frequencies above 300 gigahertz, uh, then electronic sources offer lower efficiencies. Uh, so uh, these technologies, especially plasmonic receivers that I showed, offer uh, tremendous efficiency and sensitivity in detection. Uh, so uh, I believe for 6G technology that uh, can be very promising. And there are several groups that I have already used it in different communication uh, demos. Uh, we have uh, used it as well in my group. Uh, but even the current technology, when it comes to base stations, uh, thinking of big conference center, uh, backhaul uh, data centers, uh, in those cases, because a transmitter is transmitting massive data at different frequencies by multiplexing different channels, uh, the photoconductive devices offer much higher level of parallelism, optical uh, terahertz powers. Uh, so for uh, those base stations, I think even 5G uh, would benefit a lot. Okay, great. We'll move to the next one. Uh, hello, Professor Mona. May I ask if a photoconductive terahertz source based on plasma antenna are currently commercialized? Uh, can be commercialized? Was that a question? Yeah, a commercially already commercialized or not? I see. Uh, so yes, we have, uh, actually we have a spin-off company okay. that we are building these devices. Uh, I must say we are not selling products yet. Uh, we are working uh, with potential customers that are more in the industrial sector mm -hmm. uh, to uh, optimize uh, our instruments. Uh, so it is in that other way, right? Yeah. Oh, where did the next question is uh, how wide is the beam from the telehealth source based on plasmonic antennas? Uh, can you repeat the beginning? How high is the beam? How wide? The widest of the I beam. See. Yeah. I see. Um, I'm not sure if the question is asking about spectral width or time width or mm -hmm. uh, uh, spatial width. And, uh, but the answer to all of this will be, well, we have a lot of uh, uh, width tunability. So uh, if we talk about spectral width, I showed that uh, we are achieving bandwidth exceeding five terahertz. Uh, in terms of time width, well, uh, we are interested in very short pulses. Uh, uh, so usually we achieve uh, full width half maximum width of 0.3 uh, picosecond because we are interested in broad bandwidth and they have a reverse operation. In terms of spatial width, uh, if you're asking, uh, it depends on what kind of application we're targeting. Uh, so we do nano, uh, nano uh, scale uh, terahertz sensing when we use AFM tip to confine terahertz radiation at nanoscale to get very high focus, but also we uh, folk, like uh, we expand our beam to several centimeter when we want to excite our terahertz focal plane arrays uh, to scan a large area in high speed. So all of these are possible with terahertz optics. Okay, uh, here we came to this question so just now that one was similar. So would you please explain the measurement you know, the method for the photometers in details. How does it contact with the fiber? How is the waveguide? Where is the waveguide? So I the see. measurement for the photo emitter. Uh, okay, so let me see. I think I have a set up picture somewhere here. 
so our setups, uh, I in my talk, I showed several experiments. Um, I'm not sure which particular one you're asking, depending if we do terahertz spectroscopy, time domain, frequency domain, or spectrometry, uh, we have different setups. Uh, so here I show the most popular setup that is used for uh, broadband spectroscopy. Uh, basically, we use a, a femtosecond laser uh, that uh, we split the beam, we pass one beam to, through an optical delay stage. Can, this can be a piezo shaker, or sometimes we produce an optical delay electronically uh, through uh, delay uh, fiber coupled um, uh, delay modules, phase modulators. Uh, then uh, a copy of our optical beam excites our terahertz source. So we generate a terahertz pulse. And the terahertz pulse, when it's focused back on a detector, is probed with the other copy of the optical, uh, optical beam that is time delayed. Uh, now, uh, this time delay allows us uh, to scan optical uh, probe that uh, probe the terahertz beam relative to the terahertz beam. And this way, we can uh, extract the time domain response in a very efficient way without being limited by speed of the electronics. So that uh, generally gives us the time domain response and to generate the spectrum, uh, like the one I'm showing here, we get the Fourier transform of the time domain response. Okay, great, Mona. Yeah, we control the time very well. And uh, thank you very much for your talk. And uh, it's our great honor to give a certification for you. Yeah, from ICAX Talk, that's uh, your technology connect the world and the universe. So Mona, we're proud of you. Yeah, that's for you. I will send the electric version to you. And then when we met, I delivered the hard copy to you. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thanks again yeah. for uh, inviting me. Okay, great. So that's all for today's talk. So tomorrow the talk will be, uh, next week, the talk will be for the energy harvesting. Please stay with us. And uh, this will be later, the talks are going on. Now we should move on to, you know, the award part for who will be the winners for 